I don't normally start these videos with hooks, but on this occasion I will start with one. I, I realise not everyone can read the International Phonetic Alphabet, but this is just a quick thing for the phonologists watching before we start. This is a transcription of a man saying, and they ran the fox straight to the same hole. And this is from a recording of a native English speaker with no speech impediments or anything like that. It was recorded in the early 1950s, and this is just to show how different northeastern pronunciation has been from standard English within the last hundred years or so. And you can skip to the time on screen if you want to get straight to that. Even today, if you asked a British English speaker to give you an example of a really divergent accent, northeastern accents would probably be quite high on the list. And like most modern accents, they exist on a kind of continuum where some people speak more broadly and some people speak more in line with the standard. And for a lot of people, it will depend who they're talking to. So I'm going to have a look at the modern pronunciation of Geordie English and Northeastern English today. And my good pals Amy, Nathan and Sarah have agreed to record some voice samples very kindly. So I'll go through the recordings and point out various things and we'll build up a vowel chart as we go. So for people who haven't seen this chart before, I put up a bit of information on the screen about how to read it. I set a trap to catch a mouse. I set a trap to catch a mouse. A really characteristic feature of northeastern accents is the way word final plosives are pronounced. So a feature that's spread probably from London over the last 200 years or so is glottal reinforcement. And I've talked about this before, so it's where a glottal stop gets shoved between a vowel and the voiceless plosive p, t, k at the end of a word. And this hasn't happened in a lot of cases in Geordie accents. So when I say trap, they'd say more like trap, trap. But even though you don't have this glottal reinforcement, you do still have the t phoneme getting realised as a glottal stop sometimes at the ends of words. So you can hear that in Amy's pronunciation of the word set. I set a trap. I set a trap. But in Nathan's pronunciation of set, you can hear something a bit different. So this happens in a lot of situations where you have a vowel, then a voiceless plosive, per t, k, and then another vowel. And it, it's similar to glottal reinforcement. So that e vowel is cut short by a glottal stop, set, set. And then after that, the tongue moves as if it were going to pronounce the t, but it doesn't realise the plosive, it just jumps to the next vowel. Setter, setter, butter, butter. I set a trap, I set a trap. And this happens across the northeast, and it also happens in pockets of the southeast, especially around London. Um, I'm not aware of it happening anywhere else, but that doesn't mean it doesn't. So bear in mind the glottal stop is very common, butter, butter, across the UK but it's the glottal stop unreleased plosive sequence that's rarer. Butter, butter. I don't actually know where this comes from. In Cockney English, it seems like a natural progression of the glottalisation that happens anyway, but Geordie English doesn't really have that as much, as I've said, especially in older speakers. Uh, but this, this thing has clearly been around for a while, so I couldn't say where that comes from. I like collecting stones for my stone collection. I like collecting stones for my stone collection. Someone spray painted a wholesome picture on the front of my house. Someone spray painted a wholesome picture on the front of my house. I climb up the walls to evade capture. I climb up walls to evade capture. Most of what makes an accent characteristic is the vowel system. And northeastern accents have quite interesting vowel systems. So to start with, they don't have the foot strut split, which means that foot and strut rhyme in Geordie accents, which they do in most northern English accents. So that's not that unusual and I'll talk more about that in a later video. There are a few different kinds of vowels, so I'll talk about them in order. Firstly, we'll talk about the short monophthongal vowels, which in my accent are things like ah, ah, eh. Both of the speakers here centralise these quite a lot, so they're pronounced with the tongue further towards the middle of the mouth, they're laxer. So the clear, unambiguous ones are ah, eh, eh, o, oh, o. Oh. And these aren't too surprising for Northern English, apart from the central unstressed vowel, to evade capture. To evade capture. And then you have a load of long vowels and diphthongs that are a bit harder to categorise. So a diphthong, for those who don't know, is a vowel that glides from one place in the mouth to another. The tongue moves in the mouth or the lips move from rounded to unrounded or something like that. So A, O, or something like that in my accent. And the diphthongs developed in a couple of different ways historically. Either they came from what was historically a long monophthong or they came from what was historically a vowel and then a rhotic sound like r. So I'll give examples of both, although I don't have time to go through them all. So in both a uh, Amy and Nathan's accents, the word mouse is similar to how it is in most English accents. A diphthong, although the onset is a tiny bit more central than mine. Instead of ow, you have ow, ow. Now throughout all of Britain in Middle English, this vowel was oo, as in moose. 
and it changed at different times in different places. So in the south, the vowel started to diphthongize towards the modern sound in the uh, sort of 1400s, 1500s with what's called the Great Vowel Shift, and that change spread across the country. But only in the last hundred years or so has that change affected Geordie accents, Cumbrian accents, and Scottish accents. So until possibly the early 1900s, the most common pronunciation of mouse across these areas was monothongal, as in moose or moose. And that's how a lot of people still pronounce it. And the reason that held on for so long is because the Great Vowel Shift affected the North differently than it affected the South. So in the North it had a lot more effect on the front vowels and not so much effect on the back vowels. But Amy and Nathan have the more recent pronunciation, at least in this context, of mouse, mouse. An interesting Geordie-specific pair of vowels are the ones in stone and name, so stone and name. I like collecting stones for my stone collection. And the history of these is quite complicated and it involves influence from the north and the south. Before the Great Vowel Shift in southern England, you had stone and nam. And in parts of southern Scotland, you had stan and nam. These words were probably in the same lexical set. But you also had words like nought, which had, no, uh, which had a back vowel. During the Great Vowel Shift in the South, Storn and Nam became Storn and Nam, the vowels raised. But in southern Scotland, these vowels probably broke to centering diphthongs. Stern and Nam became Stern and Nam, and Nort became Nort. So these er and or sounds are a lot like the ones you find in later Geordie accents, and they probably spread southwards into Cumbria and the northeast, where that influence is still fairly strong but also into Yorkshire and Lancashire where it's now more diluted. So along with stern and nam, you also had words like ham and ern, home and one, which went on to become yem and yen in modern Geordie accents. But anyway, this explains words like nort in a modern Geordie accent, but it doesn't explain words like storn and born and words like that, because in the 16 and 1700s, these were probably pronounced stern and bern, which went on to become stien and bien, which are how some older speakers pronounce them now. So all the while, you had the pronunciations storn and born in the south with this long monothong or. And I don't know what exactly happened at this point because I've not studied northeastern dialects specifically before this video. But what I suspect probably happened is that you have a phonological system in the northeast where or as a monothong doesn't exist because it's broken to or. And when people adopt loan words, they adapt them to their own phonology. So when northeastern people hear southern words like storn and born, they'll adapt those words as storn and born to match their nort lexical set that they already have, rather than creating a new lexical set. So as these southern forms in the 1700s or so get pushed northwards, people adapt them to their own phonology, and that's why you get storn and born, although someone else might be able to give more detail about that or just correct me. I think maybe words like yem and yen probably survive for the same reason that yam and yan survived in Cumbria, um, because they've, they've changed to the point that they're no longer recognisably the same words. People don't think of them as an accented version of the word, they just think of them as a different word completely. So yen is no, you know, it's, it's, rec it's not recognisably the same word as one, even though they mean the same thing, and they're cognate. And yem does actually sound almost identical to the Norwegian word for home, which is yem, I think. But although there are a lot of Old Norse um, loan words in the northeast, I don't think this is one of them because it follows the exact phonological rules you'd expect it to follow if it was a native word. And that similarity there is probably just a coincidence. I like lying in the soil and watching the stars. I like lying in the soil and watching the stars. The diphthong in soil is interesting because the lips don't round much throughout the entire thing. Some jackdaws flying over there. Very nice. Um, but yeah, the diphthong in soil is interesting um, because the lips don't round much throughout it. So most accents in English have it starting with a more rounded vowel. Oi, oi. But not in this case, it's more like, I don't know whether I can imitate it. More like, oi, oi. Soil, um, no, no, I can't imitate it. But another thing is that Amy has the goose vowel slightly diphthongized, and Nathan doesn't. Now there's only one goose here. Now there's only one goose here. And another thing is that northeastern dialects are similar to other English dialects in that they're mostly non-rhotic, so you don't pronounce a r sound unless it comes before a vowel. And that's only appeared fairly recently in the northeast because of southern influence. But that means in situations where you used to have a vowel and then a r, nowadays you just have a vowel, which in some cases is realised as a diphthong. So you can see examples of this in star, here, bird, and bear. 
Star and bear have monothongs which are held for a long time, just like in my accent, are air. Watching the stars. Now there's only one goose here. The bird escaped the bear. And for both of them, the vowel in here is very diphthongized. In Nathan's case, I'd say it, it, almost it's just a semi-vowel vowel sequence, like ya, yeah, ya. Yeah. Now there's only one goose here. And that's not too surprising, because a lot of the time when a vowel rhotic sequence loses its rhotic, you end up with a centering diphthong like ear. And in some accents, that's smoothed to ear, like mine. But in their accents, it's done the opposite. The two ends of the diphthong have moved further apart in the mouth, so you end up with something like hya. In terms of vowels that have historically been long, there are loads and loads of ways you could analyse vowel length in Geordie accents. So I've done a video on phonemic vowel length um, in the past, and many people would argue that a dialect only has a meaningful vowel length distinction if you have pairs of words where the only difference between them is how long you hold the vowel for. And Nathan and Amy definitely have pairs of words that are only different because of vowel length. They have a long short pair in e eh and er, eh. Amy has one in a uh and ah, uh, and also one in o uh and o. Uh. I did wonder if northeastern accents maybe adhered to the Scottish vowel length rule, which I've talked about in another video, and my friend Sarah very, uh, very kindly recorded a few words. Goose, geese, gate, nose, bees, smoke, name, gave. Bearing in mind the environment here is really artificial, and this isn't the standard you go for in an academic paper. This is a graph of the vowel lengths in seconds, which I got using Prat, which is a piece of spe uh, speech analysis software. According to the Scottish vowel length rule, you'd expect the longer vowels to be the ones I've highlighted in red. So you can see that for this speaker at least, that rule doesn't seem to apply. So what about this older northeastern accent I talked about at the start? Well, I've got this from the Autumn Survey of English Dialects, which I'll link in the description. It's a very fantastic resource for this kind of thing. And this particular speaker is from Northumberland, so a bit further north than um, the speakers here. And he was born in 1879 and recorded in 1953 when he was in his mid-70s. And he shows a northeastern feature which is extremely interesting called the Northumbrian burr. And it's one of the most surprising realisations of the rhotic sound r in the entire Anglosphere. It's a uvular fricative, r, r, and sometimes it's a bit labialised, r, r. Listen to him say, and they ran the fox straight to the same hole. And they ran the fox straight to the same hole. And he went in, and George went in. He lost his dog now the week after, the same hole. The vowels are very similar to Nathan and Amy's. A, uh, O, uh, E, U. Uh. And like a lot of far northern dialects south of the Scottish border, you get clear non velarized L in all positions in the word for L. So if I were to say hole in my accent, the l is pronounced more like l, l, with the back of the tongue raised against the palate. But in his accent, you don't get that raising. The l is like it would be in any other position. L, l. And you can hear that again when he repeats himself, um, when he says same hole. Same hole. Same hole. And that's very similar to Siam Wall in Cumbrian, because the phonologies are very similar. And this weird r sound affected vowels at the ends of words as well, so they became uvularized. And I think the same thing happens in Glaswegian accents. You get these uvularized vowels at the ends of words where r sounds used to be. So the comedian Kevin Bridges um, is an example I've used before of, of, of that. I also remember my first ever altercation. So maybe at some point this r was a common thing in Northern England and Scotland. I know Roger Lass has made an argument that the uvular r makes a lot more sense in Old English and accounts for some diphthongizations in Old English. Um, but Robert Howell disagrees with this and says it's more likely that this uvular pronunciation is just a thing that's appeared in the northeast at some point down the line. So whether it's an old thing or a, a more recent thing is, is, is not completely clear. I'm looking into the matter of Scottish influence on Northern English dialects as part of a wider project, so I might get round to looking at that audio recording a bit more at some point in the future. But I hope this has provided a decent overview of some aspects of modern northeastern phonology. Um, and thank you very much indeed for watching. I'll see you soon. Somebody you don't know, don't mind a for the, for the get your, you know, uh, dogs couldn't get out. Oh, you couldn't hear them went right away and uh, undermine. Joe Anderson had them now with his life, no, no. Joe wanted to blast the place up and I lost, and then I lost another one.